Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another podcast. I'm very excited about this one. Um, I've been following our guest for a long time. I've been to her events. I've seen what she's done in the industry. I've seen what she's done for cancer research. It's absolutely amazing, um, especially when you get into her story and you hear that a lot of this was developed during her 20s. So I'm very excited for y'all to understand and see what Brittany A. Bear Franklin has to say about how she became one of the number one uh, producers for sponsorships and money into the cancer research um, through Sky High um, and her fundraising program. Uh, so let's just talk a little bit about Brittany here. So Brittany excelled in the oil and gas industry while building Sky High for kids and her personal time. She utilized her contacts and resources within the industry to build events throughout Texas and Louisiana, raising millions of dollars to fund research projects. Sky High for Kids was officially founded in 2007 and successfully operated as a volunteer run organization until 2014. In 2018, Brittany became the foundation's full-time CEO, and today she's leading a team raising millions of dollars to fund uh, pediatric cancer research. We're so happy to have you on, Brittany. Thank you so much. I am honored to be here with two amazing leaders and two amazing women at that. <laughs> All right. Well, let's dig right in. Um, you grew up in Abbeville, Louisiana on a crawfish farm. Can you tell us a little bit about what life was like growing up as Brittany and also the impact that the pageant lifestyle had on you? Yes. So I, I grew up in um, a small town, like you say, called Abbeville, Louisiana, and actually grew up a little bit further south of that in a small community uh, called Mouton Cove a very um, influential farming community, rice and crawfish primarily, but lots of sugar cane as well. My family has had uh, a rice, crawfish and sugar cane farm for quite some time. And my dad was really, really um, focused on his oil and gas career from a, a early age. In fact, 15 years old when he quit high school and started working manual labor offshore for a logistics company. And so what life was like for me was hard work. Let me tell you, we were uh, taught that things don't fall from the sky and you work for everything that you want to achieve in life. So we had a lot of responsibility at a very young age, whether it was helping uh, in the crawfish fields itself or you know, helping with our uh, lamb up operation. We raised uh, sheep and, and had 4-H lambs for many years. I showed lambs in 4-H for almost 10 years. It was a huge part of my life. Um, taught us, like I said, a lot of work ethic and responsibility. So our daily routine was wake up, go to the barn, go to school, come back from school activities, go back to the barn, finish your work, and then come in for dinner as a family. And so growing up that way was uh, extremely impactful in you know, the way that my life was shaped. Uh, and I'm extremely appreciative for being able to be raised that way, especially in the outdoors. Uh, we hunted and fished, and that was our weekend activities as a family. Uh, and then to really get into how the pageant industry or pageant circuit affected my life was a very different uh, moment for me. Uh, my mom decided to uh, put me in a pageant. It was the Cattle Festival pageant in Abbeville, very small town thing, uh, but it was something that meant the world to the community. And at 13 years old, I got on that stage and went through a round of interview questions and was crowned the Deb Cattle Festival queen. And when I tell you there was a shock and awe for me personally and a shock and awe in the audience because here was this very, you know, this, this form girl from nowhere who hadn't been in pageants in her entire life. And takes the crown and, and that's what really started my path into servant leadership and getting involved in the community. That's really amazing. And I know that during the pageant time too, you mentioned in our first talk that that is where you really got into, um, you know, the fundraising of uh, St. Jude, which is really exciting. Yes. Um, so what was really neat was a pageant director, Miss Billy Minard, she always encouraged her queens to raise money for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital it was very special to her. And that's when I was introduced to childhood cancer and actually took my first road trip north of I-10 all the way to Memphis, Tennessee to visit the hospital uh, firsthand. And that's the moment it, it changed my life. 
Wow. The impact people have on your life in the beginning, you know, really says a lot about who you became today. Uh, you know, what's also really interesting about your story is we know during your high school years, you faced many adversities, um, losing your home, your dad got into a horrible accident, um, and you struggled in high school. This didn't hold you back from being ambitious. You were working at a high-end restaurant in Louisiana at this time to save money for college. Um, you would serve a group of men on a weekly basis, um, and these men ended up actually changing your life. This was a big turning point for you. Can you walk us through this time when you first accepted this challenge to raise the 10K for St. Jude um, as a senior high school student? Yes. So, so kind of backing up just a tiny bit. I've always had a job. I think 13 years old, started working at a crawfish restaurant, Cajun Claws in Abbeville, worked at the veterinarian clinic, then became a lifeguard at the country club. Always had a job. My, my family taught us how important it was to understand what real adult life would be like at a very uh, young age, right? Because my parents started young. And so, uh, you know, in college, I worked at Edie's Restaurant and went to school full time at University of Louisiana at Lafayette. I supported myself through college, including a tuition. And I'm very proud to say I had zero student debt, no loans taken out. Um, and so I served a very big part of our Lafayette community. And that was the oil and gas industry not really understanding who I was serving at the time, but I built relationships with some pretty powerful people in the industry, uh, whether it was Donald Mosing from Frank's Casing Crew, or the Knight family, or Charlie Kilgore from Kilgore Marine, and so forth. I was serving these amazing people who not only were huge philanthropists in the community, but they were leading uh, some of the biggest service companies in our industry. And mm -hmm. so uh, I was challenged by the same lady, Miss Billy Menard, who I had known so many years ago, right, who introduced me to St. Jude, and uh, she came to all of her older queens, you know, we had just uh, started college, if you will, and asked us to raise $10,000, and so I remember at that moment, uh, I was actually getting ready to apply to law school, and, um, you know, my plate was really full. I was working at that time two jobs and, again, putting myself through school. And so I remember being like, oh, my gosh, I don't know if I can do this. But I also remember the feeling I had when I walked through the halls of St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and kind of that seed that God had planted then. And so what I didn't realize at the time was that God was kind of giving me my sign, right? Here it is once again. And so I decided to act on that uh, passion that I had for so many kids that were, you know, fighting for their lives. And I shot sporting clays, like you said, on Fridays uh, with, uh, with all the, the oil and gas uh, people that I served. And so one thing led to another. I decided to put a budget on paper at the school library. In fact, we found that same budget and have it here at the office. I want to frame it because y'all would just die laughing if you could see the scribble scrabble on that piece of paper. Um, I'll write everything down still today. And so I, I put together a plan of how we could accomplish this $10,000 goal with a small uh, sporting clay tournament on a Friday. And before I could blink, the girls that I worked with at Edie's, you know, I went to them for help, Crystal and Holly and Marla and, and so many others and said, hey, this is getting a little bit bigger than I ever imagined. We have over a hundred people registered. You know, Edie's was a hot spot, so the flyers were flying off the counters. It opened a bank account under Sky High, and you know, with a hundred dollar bill I had made on a Friday morning serving breakfast. And before I know it, we've got upwards of twenty thousand dollars in the bank account, right? <laughs> wow. So I know that you made the decision after the clay shoot not to finish school. I mean, your goal was to go to law school. Um, and after that, you also received multiple offers from oil and gas companies after your successful clay shoot that you raised $70,000, which was, I mean, it's huge. That's insane. Um, what do you think made your oil and gas supporters like Donald Mosing from Franks International, Charlie Kilgore from Kilgore Marine and some of the other really important people who have been there from the beginning supporting you. Why do you think they took such a big risk on you, especially without having finished school and not really any experience in oil and gas? Correct. Um, so I, I, I know that Jamie kind of touched on it. Uh, we didn't go into detail, but I did go through quite some adversity in my high school times. And, you know, my parents divorced. It was a very ugly divorce. My dad 
um, went into deep depression. My mother ended up in drug uh, rehab almost my entire senior year of school. Our house burned down. My grandfather had a heart attack. I mean, I felt like there was just like nothing else that could happen um, in my life at the time. And I really turned to God in my faith. And so, you know, fast forwarding to the college, I think that these business owners saw and understood my ability to work really hard. They, you know, we went into that biscuit shop at 4.30 in the morning. We would work till 9.30 and then we'd go to class. I mean, Stanley Lease, who built Edie's, really trained and molded some amazing women and taught us what the big picture meant in life, whether it was through faith, our family, but really through work ethic. And I think these people saw good, you know, personality and just this grit and attitude and determination to never give up. And so when I approached everyone uh, with the idea of fundraising for children, again, fighting for their lives in St. Jude, which, yes, a big national brand, you know, they were on board. I mean, they didn't question it, right? They trusted me because they had they'd watched me and interacted with me for so many years at that restaurant. And, you know, for having zero experience in the nonprofit space, much less on how to fundraise, I figured it out very quickly. And I think that's something I learned, you know, during my childhood years of how to adapt and be flexible and pivot and, and really learn how to jump into something that may not be, you know, my comfort zone uh, and, and just ask questions, surround myself with people that are smarter than me, and, and, and really just take the bull by the horns and, and go for it, right? Take the risk. And so it was the same, uh, you know, risk that I took when I decided to leave University of Louisiana at Lafayette my senior year. I was determined to go to law school. It's the only thing I really thought that I would do growing up. And so I went into school. I was an English and history major, never changed my major, never missed class. I was, I was that kid that went to class every day. Um, and, you know, when St. Jude came back into my life, again, I just, I, I kind of heard what God was saying. Although it wasn't the sign that I wanted, it was the sign that I needed to respond to. And so uh, it is, I'm going into my final semester. We just hosted the Sporting Clay Tournament. We raised $70,000, you know, group of girls that were in our 20s serving biscuits for crying out loud. And we made an impact in the Lafayette community and people were just amazed. And the oil and gas companies that came to the tournament and supported us turned around and said, Brittany, hey, we want you to come to work for us. And I'll never forget that moment. I was like, uh, oil and gas? No way. My dad got on a helicopter seven and seven for so many years and in fact crashed in a helicopter in 1989 in the Gulf of Mexico. Thankfully he survived but it you know he lost his entire career in that accident and so I didn't have any knowledge really of what the industry was all about. I just saw my dad getting on a helicopter you know every other week and so um, with that said, uh, you know, I got the opportunity to become a project services coordinator at Pegasus International, and I remember very vividly in that interview, which was the second interview, because I had went to them for a sponsorship for the Sporting Clay Tournament, right? Here walked in this 20, you know, one-year-old girl, and she's like, telling you all about this Sporting Clay Tournament and the passion for childhood cancer, and all these men were like, who is who is this, you know? And then I, I came back to Houston with my dad who was educating me on the four hour drive across I-10 and my Honda Civic on what platforms were and, and what pipelines were and what it meant, you know, to, to be in the oil and gas industry. And he was really proud of his career and I was really proud of him. And so uh, I interviewed with Tom Sneed and I basically looked at him and said, you will not find anyone that will work harder than me I may not understand Excel spreadsheets because I did not know how to work Excel and I still really don't to this day, don't tell anybody. <laughs> but uh, you will not find someone that uh, will work harder than me. And I knew that if I could sell my ability to bust butt and learn the inspection side of the pipeline industry, that I could be successful and really provide solutions to Pegasus International and ultimately our clients. 
Well, that's just amazing that you were able to do that. But what I think is even more amazing is that during the time when you're working for them, uh, you were also managing and building up uh, Sky High. Uh, so, I mean, at this time, you, um, you had a team that you were trying to work with uh, within Sky High. Um, how did you manage to coordinate the team with little experience in building it on profit business while also a little experience in oil and gas. So you're learning about, you know, your Pegasus International job while you are also, you know, growing this massive, um, you know, nonprofit. I worked 24 <laughs> seven. That's the answer. I worked 24 seven. I remember getting up, you know, super early every morning and putting in as much time as possible at Pegasus. At one time, Tom and I were managing over 120 inspection personnel. Uh, on big, deep, you know, uh, deep water pipeline vessels, all the way to inspectors at the spool base, to us dabbling into onshore projects at the time. And I was really um, the person that learned uh, in the moment or in the experience, if you will. I'm a hands-on uh, a learner, if you will. I don't, I can read a million times, but if I can see it, then it clicks. And when it clicks, it's there forever. So I went out in the field quite a bit and um, really busted my butt as, as much as I could the first six months. And then at night, Jamie, I would get on my computer and start pumping out logistics for the next sporting clay tournament. We took the event in Lafayette, took it to Houston because I was just determined to, you know, bring something here. I knew that it would be such an influential community and space for the childhood cancer community. I just... I just had to get my feet wet, right? And I just had to understand the industry and learn the people. And so my boss and my company, Pegasus, was super supportive of my time. Uh, although I managed, you know, of course, to do both jobs uh, uh, efficiently, I, I just concentrated on those two things, to be honest, right? And so I would get up early, I'd go to bed late, I would, you know, coordinate inspectors. I mean, you're on call 24 seven, people are mobbing and demobbing at all times. And it's the same for the fundraising business. I mean, it's, you're basically in sales 24 seven, you're, you're telling your trust uh, and your mission, right? And for us, we, we want to end childhood cancer. And so, um, you know, we always had that light at the end of the tunnel and how could we, how could we get there? And so Lafayette to Houston, Houston to San Antonio and Anadarko Petroleum really put us on the map there when I would see a client uh, that I was working for at Pegasus, I would also mention Sky High, right? I would just say, hey, by the way, there's a sporting clay tournament coming up in September. Love for you to take a look at the flyer. That's all I would say. I would just start handing out flyers. And so I was able to build Sky High alongside the oil and gas industry through the amazing work I did at Pegasus and then Universal Pegasus once we merged, uh, along with the most dynamic and hardworking team of volunteers ever. I mean, we still have people today that have been with us for 14 and 15 years since 2007. And so I give full credit to our team of volunteers and uh, now to our staff and board and regional committee members for really working uh, just as hard as I do. And so I think it all boils down to you know, work ethic again, and that grit and determination to never give up. And so uh, it was quite a juggle, Jamie. I didn't date, you know, that much. I wasn't in serious relationships, but I wasn't the woman that was like, I need to get married and have kids. And I, I just wanted to focus on my career in oil and gas, which I absolutely fell in love with, and building the nonprofit that I didn't really, I mean, even until 2014, although we started raising millions of dollars with the oil and gas industry support, I didn't understand what it fully meant to build a company, run a team, and expand, right, the mission as far as we could. Uh, and so there was still a lot to learn, and 2014 was a pivotal moment for us. So I, well, first of all, uh, thank you so much for sharing that. It's, you're so empowering and motivating, even just how you talk. I'm like, we could do it too, you know? <laughs> and it, it's really awesome that your employer supported, fully supported you and was like, you know, she could do both and not feel like, you know, 
sky high, maybe taking away from them. And they were totally on board with even you talking to customers about it. So like really good for them to have supported you. And I mean, I think they realized it was a good cause and uh, that's really amazing to have had that support early on. Um, so I know when we spoke, you mentioned something that really spoke to me. Um, you said that people should work on things that they're good at and not so much focus on the things that, you know, they are not so good at. Um, because I know sometimes a lot of people will say like, okay, you know, you don't, let's say you don't listen well, so you should work on, you know, listening better or, you know, like you always kind of have to work on that one area that you're not as good in. But I have heard kind of similar to what you said is like, no, work on the things that you're really, really good at. Can you expand a little bit on that? Yes. Yeah, so I think those are kind of two parts, right? So yes, if, if, if becoming a better listener is something that is going to make you a better person in general and make you more successful, uh, whether you work for a company or you are the leader of a company, that's important. And those are things that I think people should always work on, right? Something that is a, a feedback of mine for a long time, and I'm still continuing to work on it is you know, I can have a little bit too much of a powerful attitude, or if you want to say the word aggressive, go right ahead. You know, yes, I do. And so I've learned through coaching. I have a full-time executive coach now, um, and through the entrepreneurship organization that I that I'm a part of, and all of my mentors on how to work on different aspects and characteristics of yourself um, that is going to make you become or help you become a better leader. Right. I mean, it's important that. Uh, if you are a business owner or a leader of a team of any of any kind in any industry that you uh, work really hard to become a leader that's respected versus popular uh, and a leader that leads with heart and uh, empowers and inspires everyone around them, uh, including their team. And so when I said work on the things that you're really good at versus what you're not good at, kind of meant, or I did mean, for example, I am a natural born relationship builder. I'm a natural ability to inspire people. I have energy that should be bottled up apparently and sold, you know, at every major store. Um, and I uh, just have a work ethic that really inspires and helps people move forward and I have the ability to provide solutions uh, and see something all the way through and close a deal, right? So after the inspection part of my career, I was moved to corporate sales and knocked it out of the park. Didn't happen in the very beginning. Believe me, there was a lot to learn and a lot of failure that came along with that. And I think being able to failure and move forward and never give up, again, never give up attitude. Um, you know, I, I was just good at sales. I mean, this was my gig. Learn the product, learn the solution that you can provide to the client, and then see it all the way through was something I was really good at. Um, the ability, again, to build relationships and trust and, and ask questions and not be afraid and, and kind of be fearless versus, look, I am not the person that's going to produce a uh, amazing proposal or the person that's going to... Uh, I don't know, you know, any major administrative things or different, there's just different things, right? So I believe in surrounding myself with people who are smarter than me in all these different divisions. Marketing communications, not not my gig. I mean, I, I don't think I should go back to school, learn how to do better in marketing communications because, well, it may help me as a leader in my business. No, you know, I should continue with my leadership uh, building skills, right? I should continue working with mentors and other leaders on how to become better leaders in strategic planning, right? That's something I need need to be very good at in how to manage cash flow, how to manage and inspire and empower my people, and ultimately uh, execute what we're here to do, and that's to save lives. And so I'm going to work on those things because it's kind of like, again, it's that, it's that, uh, God-given talent, if you will. I'm not going to go to an Excel class. I'm not going to go learn how to re uh, write a grant, right? I'm not doing it, right? It's, it's, I'm not good at it already. I'm not, no, I'm going to hire someone who has that skill set and also 
who is able to learn and build on that skill set themselves, right? Versus yeah, what I really like about where you're going with this is that you accepted the fact that there's some things that you're not good at. And I think there's a, a point where some leaders don't ever accept that fact and they try to control everything. And that ended up hurting the business overall because all they had to do was appoint to somebody who actually knew it more than them except that they know it more than them and allow them to take that role and that's exactly what you did here which i think is why it became so successful um what i, I want to for me jamie <laughs> i told you i can get long-winded so thank you <laughs> <laughs> no it's okay um, what I wanted to switch back to here is, uh, you know, Macy and I started this podcast because we understood that there's this black cloud that, you know, some people find over oil and gas. So we kind of mentioned and talked about this when we first uh, spoke with you a few weeks ago. Um, and you are very passionate about this industry, obviously. Um, we can see it in your voice and everything that you've done. Um, but, you know, oil and gas companies do save lives. And you've mentioned that too. Uh, and, you know, how has the oil and gas community helped save children from cancer? You know, I know that the support that they've given you has allowed you to pledge to $40 million to St. Jude Children's Research Hospitals and Texas Children Cancer and Hematology Center. So in the next 10 years, that's what you've pledged. I mean, tell us a little, about, uh, a little bit about how oil and gas companies have helped you do this. So oil and gas uh, is the reason why I am here today, why our team is in place today, why our mission is thriving, why our vision is so clear. They, uh, this industry has gotten us off the ground since 2007 and never left our side. Although we understand we need to diversify to grow and to become uh, you know, more successful and impact the childhood cancer community uh, even more. The oil and gas industry is our roots, it's our background, and I think and know in my heart that it always will be. We have managed to donate over $14 million to date, not only help build the Eric Trump Foundation Surgery and ICU Center, which is the only one of its kind in the country for children, uh, you know, receiving the most intricate brain surgeries and I mean it's 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 the only ICU center and surgery center of its kind eight kids a day enter that uh, ICU center and sky high for kids with the oil and gas industry support donated five million dollars towards those efforts we built a power grid at the Ron McDonald house of Memphis to keep 53 families uh, you know from losing electricity if you will kids are going through extensive long treatments, uh, whether it's chemotherapy, radiation, et cetera, and power is extremely important. And it's something that uh, people need to realize that fossil fuels and the oil and gas industry is who powers about 84% of this world. And so we were really, really excited to support the power grid at Ron McDonald, $1.25 million. And in fact, several employees of Anadarko, of course, you know, previous Anadarko actually flew all the way to Memphis, Tennessee to help with the engineering side of this power grid. It was, it was phenomenal to see their passion to get behind this. Um, and then we have uh, built the tumor, and, uh, a tumor Biology Center at Texas Children's. They were waiting on a machine, y'all, for years that cost $725,000 so they could specialize in customized treatment for kids that were not adapting to just blanket protocols, right? What if you're that parent? that comes in with a child that their, that their cancer does not uh, respond to the protocol that has been set in place. Well, you certainly wouldn't give up on your child, right? And the doctors at Texas Children's won't either. And because of the oil and gas industry, we're able to donate that $725,000 to purchase that machine. And now it has changed the game in certain ways of, of how some children are being treated. And so if you look at what we've been able to build, with this industry support, you are correct. They are not only saving lives, Jamie, they are reinventing the wheel when it comes to the research that's going to be done and spread all over the globe. They're re reinventing the treatment capabilities that are going to affect children all over the globe. And with this $40 million commitment, let me tell you, I'm so proud of my team. I mean, we are seven young women that you know, if, if you really want to dig deep, we probably have not, a, we don't have enough experience and we have no business pledging $40 million to childhood cancer. Okay, let's be real here. We're a very small nonprofit in the grand scheme of things. But what we have is uh, resilience, 
we have grit, we have determination, and we have this attitude to work 24 seven for kids that are just trying to start the next chapter of their lives. And we wanna give them that future. And the oil and gas industry is doing that. The oil and gas industry is not only turning on our lights and fueling our vehicles and our planes, they are saving kids' lives. So hopefully one day that teenager or that five-year-old can go to petroleum engineering school and be right back in our industry, right? I mean, they're giving kids a future. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's so motivating and empowering also just to hear it because like Jamie had mentioned, a lot of the people that we talk to that are outside of the industry, they just see us as like this bad industry. We pollute the world, we, you know, climate change and we hurt the world, but it's so nice to hear like of all the amazing things that we do do in oil and gas. And the problem is we're just not really great at showcasing it all the time and being like our best advocate. Um, so it's really, it's really awesome to see that the oil and gas industry has done all of that because even, you know, Jamie and I both working here in the U S like, I didn't know that much had gone into sky high and that it had been mainly because of oil and gas supporters. So that's really amazing. Um, I know that when we spoke to you during your first interview, you mentioned that in your twenties, you really just focused on developing your business, working really hard and not too much time for friends, relationships, and kind of just like a normal you know, girls' 20s of partying and having fun. Um, you also mentioned that during this time, you found the book Lean In, and that really inspired you to take control as a woman and own the room. Um, how, how did you manage um, to change that mindset? And then um, how did you also manage to feel like you weren't missing out on your 20s because you were so focused on your business? Or did that not really affect you or bother you? So I think if I go back to college, that's probably the, the, the four years of my life where, you know, I may have quote unquote missed out, right? I, I wasn't in a sorority. Edie's was our sorority. Um, you know, I did not tailgate. I didn't go to football games because I worked and I went to school. And so, um, but, you know, looking at my life now, I have zero regrets in that department. In my 20s, I had that same uh, kind of mindset and, and same determination to roll through my 20s that way, working and learning and, and building the nonprofit. But I will say, I'm probably the person that burns the candle at both ends and still, you know, does to this day at 36 years old. I did have a, a fair amount of social time, you know, because I had moved into a sales role at about 25 years old, I was attending a networking event in the oil and gas industry three or four nights a week. And I did have plenty of fun with tons of amazing uh, other women that I met throughout the industry that were philanthropic and that, you know, we had our 2 a.m. nights, okay, at Pub <laughs> Fiction in Midtown, believe yeah. me. But here, here's my deal. Um, you know, if I have a commitment and I am working towards a goal, whether I go out till 2 a.m. and uh, am maybe overserved, I'm getting up the next day, regardless of, you know, how the lack of sleep uh, or whatever may go into that, and I'm going to get my job done. And so uh, I burned the candles at both ends and, and did it all and, um, you know, surrounded myself with other people all the way through that had that same, um, you know, work ethic, if you will, or just that same grit and attitude uh, that, you know, we all were working towards goals. We all wanted to be you know, powerful business women one day and we would not give up and we would get there. And I remember getting on the plane and reading Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In. And that was a moment when I was feeling like I was getting rejected uh, often by the people that I was trying to sell engineering design um, projects to. Uh, and so I read that book and the most important part was uh, you need to take a seat at the table. And that's what she taught me. Don't sit in the corner. Doesn't matter if you're the only female in the room. Doesn't matter if you have the least experience and it doesn't matter if you're the youngest, okay? You have and you deserve to sit at the table. And when I read that, it just like something clicked. And I was like, hell yeah. And the next meeting we have, which was every Monday, there's a room full of engineers, managers, our CEO, and a, and, a, and a sales team, and I'm the only female in there. I remember being like, 
nope, I'm sitting right here. In fact, I'm going to sit right next to the CEO and I'm going to ask all the questions and I'm going to have no shame. And that really changed the game for me in sales, being able to, again, accept that failure, but then get back in there and like keep rolling. Um, and, and to be able to lead uh, the organization that we're leading today, you know, it's called Hyper Kids. And so Lean In was extremely important. And in fact, I just gave it to Roxy Mounter because I, I represent WellFit Energy uh, Group as a consultant still today uh, in the industry. And she's reading it now because she's our vice president and has worked there for 12 years and just needed a little bit more push uh, and a little bit more encouragement to take that seat at the table and to be confident in uh, whether you know the answer or you don't having the confidence to ask the right questions or ask any question, if you will, to be able to learn the right answer. Yes. Thank you, Brittany. I, I love that. And I think that our male co counterparts do that very well um, and that we need to definitely have the opportunity to not be so scared um, about asking those questions and about sitting, you know, like you said, next to the CEO. So, um, you know, thank you for sharing that. Um, so to finish off here, uh, you know, there's one thing that you mentioned uh, in our last conversation, and with there being 15,780 children diagnosed with cancer a year, you know, your goal is to end childhood cancer. How do we get there? What advice? Oh, great, great question. Yes, it's it's roughly 16,000 kids just in the United States alone, Jamie, that are diagnosed, and it is the number one cause of death by disease for our children, 19 years of age and younger. And there's roughly 400,000 children worldwide that are affected by cancer. And um, you'll learn a little bit about our Global Hope Pledge, where uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is hugely supported by the oil and gas industry. In fact, when I was in Uganda last year, we saw shell station after shell station um, there. And so uh, 90,000 kids a year die in Sub-Saharan Africa because of the lack of uh, treatment capabilities, education, experience from their own people, uh, drugs, uh, equipment, et cetera. And so Sky High, part of our pledge at Texas Children's is $10 million to change the game in Sub-Saharan Africa, if you will, uh, in addition to building the immunotherapy here, uh, immunotherapy center here in Houston, Texas, which is now, uh, you know, being able to treat 32 families and 10 of those are bone marrow transplant uh, children. So, uh, uh, and with St. Jude, $20 million to get behind research that's going to outlive all of us. And so how are we going to get closer? We're going to get closer by having the will to never give up and by really vetting and trusting in our medical professionals that the work that they're doing and the research they're investing in and the science behind it, uh, that, that we, uh, you know, invest dollars, right, in that research so we can learn how to better treat and ultimately find cures for childhood cancer. There are roughly 12 to 14 different types of childhood cancer, but 100 subsets. So it gets really sticky. But let's go back really quick. In 1962, Danny Thomas, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, opened those doors with the dream to eradicate childhood leukemia. It is the most common form of childhood cancer in all the land, okay? And at that time, children were literally given a death sentence, only 4% survival. And now today, 60-something years later, it is a 94% survival rate. So let's look at that. I mean, think about that lifetime, right? Amy, you are, you know, 30 years old and you have a lifetime ahead of you. And if you get behind something like uh, Sky High's uh, mission and vision and you pour in your, your love and passion and, and help us with monetary dollars, you will see at the end of your lifetime the fruits of your labor. Danny Thomas did it. So we can do it with all the different other types of childhood cancer, right? And I think one day we are gonna see an absolute 100% cure for leukemia. And so the, the ways we're gonna do it, we're gonna invest monetarily in the research. We're gonna invest in the treatment, right? Immunotherapy is a less toxic and non-invasive way to treat children, okay? That's so important for the after effects for the rest of their life. And so uh, then we're going to invest in 
education and, and educating these doctors and helping them advance, right, so they can better treat and ultimately find these cures. And so um, I will say you dig deep and it, it does take the money, right? It takes money. It takes fundraising dollars to invest in these types of research. And unfortunately, government funding is only 4%. So if you do not back organizations like Sky High for Kids and other amazing childhood cancer organizations out there, the needle's not going to move. Okay, we are responsible. We have so basi to basically oil and gas companies are the backbone of what you're doing. Yep. And those who think that your government tax dollars are going to benefit these kind of causes, they're not. So thank you so much for sharing that, Brittany. Thank you so much for putting all your passion into this. And it's really near and dear to my heart because Jason, my husband, his um, cousin died of leukemia. Um, she actually uh, was sent to Sky High, uh, no, sorry, not Sky High, sent to St. Jude. Mm -hmm. um, uh, she lived in Arkansas, and um, yes, she passed away before the age of 20. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I, I love what you're doing, and I really appreciate all the efforts. And thank you so much for coming on and telling us about this. I was not aware of a lot of the things that you shared here, and then also the money and investments that you've put in um, to supporting St. Jude and you know ending childhood cancer. So thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank y'all. I'm honored to be a part of Flipping the Barrel. I'm very proud of you two for uh, you know stepping out of your comfort zone probably and starting this podcast and for allowing us to spread not only the the love and vision of, of Sky High, but what the oil and gas industry has done to save lives. And, and uh, you know, before I end, I want to make sure that we credit our amazing team here at Sky High, our volunteers and staff, because they're really, they're, they're the real leaders here that, that have the determination to never give up. So thank you both. Thank you so much, Brittany.